Well, she was a wonderful gal. She was an angel. Uh, we, we, we met and she, uh, well, she just loved us and we loved her. As that Munchkin land was absolutely gorgeous. Bunch of little huts that were the, the home of the Munchkins and there was a parade over down the left of the stage and to the right of the stage and all the Munchkins lived in there and that was uh, 135 of us. Mm -hmm. How about that? So Metro Golden went to a lot of trouble to get a lot of people to work for them. Of course, uh, we only got $50 a week. <laughs> oh, boo, you know. It's a Mervyn Leroy production, and you can't deny that it was his clout that got this picture made at, mm -hmm. at a cost of, you know, 2.7 million, 3.2 million, whatever it was altogether. And, um, but you look at the memos that survive about what was going on from day one, even before Mervyn Leroy came to Metro officially, it was all Arthur Freed. And Arthur Freed then went on to do Babes in Arms the same year with Mickey and Judy. George Cukor, who was just about to start Gone with the Wind, was brought in. And he's the one who, uh, when Jack Haley was coming in, he implemented makeup changes in The Wicked Witch, The Scarecrow, and especially in Dorothy. He got the party dress off of her. Uh, he got a more natural look to her and told her that the irony was, and, and he meant it... Uh, in terms of MGM in 1938, he said the irony to Judy Garland is that you really are Dorothy. And the more real you are, the crazier this freak show around you is going to seem. You look at Judy Garland's life, and she was the girl from the Midwest. And her kind of tornadic talent lifted her up and carried her into a crazy world of show business. And everybody went along on the ride. That's one reason Oz is so resonant to this day. It's just part of all that. Well, and the integrated score idea was all yeah. Arthur Freed. Mm -hmm. He wanted uh, Jerome Kern at first and Ira Gershwin. A lot of different people were up for the, the mm -hmm. songs, but it fell to Harold Arlen and Yip Harburg. Even if you listen under the dialogue and you hear the little bits of Night on Bald Mountain and Shade of the Old Apple Tree and Where or Where Has My Little Dog Gone and all these little echoes, um, and when you talk about, as you did, the fact that Over the Rainbow was cut out of the film at the second preview in Pomona. It was in in San Bernardino, and they took the film to Pomona, and it's a, a legendary story. Yip and Harold are sitting there watching The Wizard of Oz with great pleasure for the second time, and, and <laughs> Aunt M says to Dorothy, find yourself a place where you won't get into any trouble, and the next thing you see is da 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 and three minutes of song out. And I, not only does that, sur I think, surprise us all for a lot of reasons, but you stop and wonder, what could they have been thinking? What would all of that underscoring have meant for the whole rest of the movie if you didn't have the song to begin with? So mm -hmm. that when the preliminary budget for Wizard of Oz was getting up to $2 million, and you could make four big movies for $2 million in 1938, the money people in New York, Lowe's Incorporated, who controlled MGM from afar said, in effect, you know, Judy Garland is going to be a star, and, and we, we, we're glad we have her, but can you get us some box office insurance? Can you get Shirley Temple from 20th Century Fox? And Louis B. Mayer didn't especially like the idea, and Arthur Freed and Mervyn Leroy didn't like the idea at all. But the great Roger Edens, who was Arthur Freed's right-hand musical man and who had already written Dear Mr. Gable for Judy and, and was one of her great champions, was sent over to Fox to listen to Shirley Temple sing in person. You know, everybody had heard her in film, but he wanted to hear her voice, you know, in the room, as it were. He came back and was very praiseworthy of Shirley's charm, but he said her vocal limitations are insurmountable. In other words, she can't sing the way we want Dorothy to sing. She can't put it across. I say this uh, as a fan, but I also say it with as much objectivity as I can muster, because somebody just recently asked me this question. Uh, they said, well, if, if Judy Garland hadn't played Dorothy, who else could have played it as effectively? And I said, well, nobody then and nobody since then and nobody now. I don't know if you want to go in either direction. Uh, thank you. I agree with you. The, um, I think the, the idea is that you, know, you try to think of girls who sang as well, danced as well, acted as well, could do the quiet humor that this calls for, could then be as charismatic as she is. That one reason this film, I think, resonates no matter what generation we're in, because certainly tastes in music and entertainers have changed in 70 years, but not where this is concerned. And a big part of that is the fact that that first scene when Judy's running up the road with, with little Terry, the dog, uh, and is worried about her pet, 
it doesn't matter if you're a little boy or a little girl, you get drawn into her concern instantly. She pulls you right in and pulls you along through the whole rest of the story. There isn't a, a child anywhere who can't identify with the idea of lo possibly losing a pet or definitely, you know, feeling nobody cares at home, nobody understands. You think about running away or you do run away and then to compound it, you're lost and you can't get home and you're wondering how to get home. Uh, who else could have put that across?